As you may have noticed, I've been gone for the last uh, two messages or three weeks. We had some great time with our kids off in Seattle, uh, in Washington. Um, three weeks ago, you know, we finished our series through First and Second Peter, and I introduced a series that I plan to start in September. On September 8th, uh, I'm calling it The Gospel, New Ancient Foundations, eight messages, shorter messages on foundational truths that undergird the simple gospel. So until the 8th, I'll just be preaching on some texts that have kind of captured my attention, and today that's Luke chapter 7. But dang, <laughs> a lot has happened in, in the last three weeks, right? I mean, there was that uh, crazy debate. Then someone tried to kill Donald Trump. Then Joe Biden dropped out of the race. Then Kamala Harris entered the race. I mean, it's just crazy. Those people could, I mean, what do you make of, of those people? You know, there are people that want us to close the border to the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And, and, and there are people that want us to open our border to criminals that would abuse our tired, our poor, and our huddled masses longing to breathe free. I mean, could you believe those people? Apparently, there are people that want to take the life of the unborn, and Jesus is the life. And there are people that want to take the choice of young mothers, and love is a choice, to choose the good in, in freedom. God is, is love. Now, I, I know there's a whole lot more to be said about all of that, but but those people, I mean, can you imagine those, those people? So uh, if you would, take just a moment, think of those people, and pray this prayer with me. Father, we give those people to you. And we ask that you would preach your word to us, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Susan Coleman grew up playing with uh, little dolls. They date, get married, and have children. She had a hope chest in her bedroom at the corner of Gallup and Peakview in Littleton, Colorado. And on May 28, 1983, Susan Coleman vowed herself to me surrendered all that hope to me in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow and plenty and want, as long as we both shall live. For 22 years, she had kept herself as a gift to be given on this day. And that night in a corner room on the second floor of the Christiana Lodge in Vail, Colorado, we consummated our covenant. Consummated our covenant in a passionate, intimate, uninhibited, free, and holy communion. She gave herself to me, body and blood, like an alabaster flask filled with perfumed oil, a fragrant offering. Now, imagine if on the, the morning of May 29th, Susan rolled over, and on my pillow, she found this. A wad of bills. And a note that said, that was great! Hope this is enough. Imagine how she'd feel. I wonder if Jesus ever felt that way. Feels that way. Or spin, spin it around. On May 28, 1983, I vowed myself to Susan Coleman in sickness and in health, joy and sorrow, plenty and want, as long as we both shall live. For, for over 41 years, and I'm not lying about this, she has literally taken every paycheck. Duty Ranking now just sends them to her. I really don't even know what they are. 
She, she could be embezzling just like a fortune. And, and if that's the case, that's okay because that's what I signed up for when I married her. I gave her permission to crucify me. But imagine if on the night of May 28, 1983, we arrived at that corner room on the second floor of the Christiana Lodge and she said to me, Peter, I, I'm tired, I'm going to sleep. And, and when I act disappointed, she, she looked at me and she said, what's wrong with you? What do you want from me? And, and imagine I explained what I wanted and she said, that's disgusting. I dressed up for you today. I dressed, I dressed up for you in the finest clothes. I stood in front of all those people. I prayed the prayer. I said the words. I paid the price. But I have spent all of my life hiding that. I can't believe you want that. I'm not giving you that. Imagine how I'd feel. I wonder if Jesus ever felt that. Or feels that. I wonder if God ever feels like we've broken his heart. We're here to celebrate communion in the sacrament of the covenant of, of grace. He's given you his body broken, his blood shed, and what would you give? Do you feel like you need to pay? Or do you feel maybe like you've already paid and, you know, now you're disappointed with what you've gotten. You've wondered, what is it that he wants? If you think that you have already paid or that you need to pay, what are you saying about God and, and about your, yourself? And can you imagine how that must make him feel? He does have feelings, you know. You break his body and, and it bleeds. Well, imagine if Susan thought she had paid, or I thought that I needed to pay, and so I let the water bills, $300 worth or so, on, on the pillow on the morning of May 29, 1983. I mean, could anything be worse than paying for love? But now imagine if on the morning of May 29, 1983, Susan rolled over and she found this on the pillow. Fragrant, beautiful, couple thorns, one red rose. Well, that would be different, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be different. And yet, what's worth more, $300 or one red rose? I think 300, the $300, I think it would have broken her heart. And yet, did you know, you can go to Costco, and if you get, go to the right time, you can get, I don't know, you can get like, the way I, I think, like 150 red roses for 300 bucks. Do you ever wonder, God, what is it that you want? I mean, seriously, in front of all those people, I came forward, I prayed the prayer at the end of the Billy Graham crusade, I dress up for you, I go to church, I pay the tithe to you, I, I never say the F word like those other effing people, but this isn't working. Love, joy, peace, patience, faith. What is it that you want? Luke seven thirty two. Jesus says, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating and drinking, uh, and eating no bread and drinking no wine, and, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all of her children. Wisdom has children. That's weird. wonder what they look like. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, the house of the Pharisee, and reclined at table. And behold, look, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. 
In those days, people would recline at table. They would recline around this low table with their feet stretched out uh, behind them. They'd be leaning on one elbow. So Jesus was invited to this banquet by a Pharisee named Simon. Pharisaios in Greek, it means something like a separated one. They were the separated ones. It was expected that first Simon would provide water for washing the guests' feet. Secondly, Simon was expected to greet a friend with a kiss on the cheek, or if it was a rabbi, a kiss on, on the hand. Thirdly, it was common to anoint an honored guest with oil. Simon does none of these things. He throws a public banquet for Jesus, but probably costing well over the equivalent of like $300 today, and in the process, he snubs Jesus. I imagine he's judging Jesus, he's, he's using Jesus, he's trying to control Jesus. But there's a woman at the banquet, not a guest but an observer. It was common in that day for someone like a a Pharisee to hold a banquet in the courtyard of their home so that the common people could uh, watch and listen to the wisdom of the great rabbis. This woman is a sinner from the city. Almost certainly she's a prostitute, and for some reason Simon knows who she is. I'm sure pretty much everyone in town knew who she was. She has an alabastron in Greek. It's an alabaster flask of perfumed oil. Alabaster is a soft rock, usually gypsum or or calcite. So an alabastron is an earthen vessel for holding anointing oil. An empty earthen vessel holding a bit of oil. And oil is the symbol of the Spirit of God. She has an alabaster flask of perfumed oil, probably hanging around her neck. Many women had them in that day, but for this woman in this profession, that ointment would have been particularly important for plying her trade. Verse 37, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she's a sinner." And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt, the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, well, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water from my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil but she has anointed my feet with ointment. He's looking at her as he speaks to Simon. So I don't think it's like he's yelling at Simon, scolding Simon. I think he feels sorry for Simon. Whatever the case, he's delighting in her. Her hair, her perfume, her kisses, her tears, with which she washes his feet. So I don't think these are tears of sorrow so much as tears of joy. In the words of Tolkien at the end of The Lord of the Rings, they passed into regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of blessedness. See, I think she is just profoundly happy. She's happy. So why did she make such a fragrant offering? 
Do you suppose that they had a stewardship campaign at the synagogue that week? Maybe some sort of ointment drive? Or... Do you suppose that she thought of this as an, invest an investment in eternity and she'd be repaid back on judgment day? Or maybe even repaid back with a better day at work tomorrow? Jesus says, Simon, you gave me no water for my feet. She has washed them with her tears. She's passionate. You know, you can't just manufacture tears like that. And with them, she washes what was considered to be the dirtiest part of a person, especially in that day. She washes his feet with her tears. And Simon, says Jesus, she wiped them with her hair. It was considered to be deeply sinful in that culture for a woman to let down her hair in public. In fact, according to the Talmud, a woman could be divorced for unbinding her hair in public. This woman's passionate and intimate. And Jesus says, Simon, you gave me no kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Do you suppose that she anointed his feet with like 10% of the oil that she had? And then thought, I wonder if that was enough. Well, I better save some for next week. I imagine she made no calculations. I would imagine that her right hand did not know what her left hand was doing. I imagine that she, what she did, it was, it was like a, a dance. She, she heard music that maybe Simon couldn't hear, and she just couldn't help but, but dance, constrained by the rhythm, and yet entirely free in doing whatever she most earnestly desired in that moment. Simon had said, if this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman is touching him. Now, this word touch uh, also means something from all the roots, that it, the roots in the word. It means something like to set a fire, to set a fire in, in yourself, or maybe to set a fire in another, to set a fire. And it was used, like in 1 Corinthians, to describe sexual relations. So this woman touching Jesus as she did well, it was quite a sight in the house of Simon the Pharisee. And so we wonder, what was she thinking? But we do know what Simon and his friends were thinking. They were thinking, this woman has no shame. No shame. Just think of it. The very same ointment from the very same flask used for the most deplorable of sins is now being offered to Jesus the Christ. She anointed the Christ. You know, you know what the Christ means? It means the anointed. She anointed the anointed with that ointment. She kissed him with those kisses from that mouth, and he seems to have like somehow thoroughly enjoyed this, this fragrant offering, this sacrifice of praise. So I bet they thought, he has no shame. <laughs> I'm sure they thought she has no shame. Is that what Jesus was? You know, this appears to have happened to Jesus quite a bit. It's actually amazing when you take a good look at it. It, it happens here in Luke. In, in John, Mary does this in Lazarus' house. Remember the week before Jesus dies. In Matthew and Mark, a woman breaks an alabaster flask of ointment over Jesus' head at the house of Simon the leopard three days before his crucifixion. Judas and all, all the disciples, they get terribly offended, and Jesus says that what she has done will be proclaimed in all the world as if at last this is exactly what he wants. Not a harlot, but a bride with no shame. Shame is such a challenging concept, isn't it? Is it good or is it bad or, or, or both? Fortunately, in Scripture, it's defined right from the start with a story. The man, the Adam, and his wife were both naked and unashamed in paradise. That's the garden of delight on the holy mountain. 
unashamed until they took and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and suddenly they knew that they were naked. And so they covered themselves with fig leaves. And you see, we all know what that feels like, right? It's called shame. Probably felt it ever since you were like, I don't know, maybe two or three years old. So is it good or bad? You know, God's very first commandment given to naked Adam and naked Eve before the fall was to be fruitful and multiply. And I can draw a diagram for you if you need me to, but that's impossible to do if you're covered in fig leaves. That is if you are always ashamed. They covered the very spot where they each knew that a part of themselves was missing. It's the very spot where two become one flesh. And so it must be the same spot where one flesh named Adam had become two. And God did that. Why did he do that? He, he put Adam to sleep and made two out of one and then commanded them to make one out of two. You remember why he did that? He did that because Adam was alone and could not find his helper, in Hebrew, his azer, who was with him. And Scripture makes it clear, God is our azer. God is our helper, our Savior. Adam was alone, and it's the first thing which God declares to be not good, which means evil. But, of course, Adam does not know this, for Adam doesn't have knowledge of good or evil. I mean, I hope you notice that in the story. And so Adam is obviously not yet finished in the image and likeness of God, who is the good, that is our helper, that is our husband. And so on the sixth day of creation, remember that on the seventh day, everything is good and it is finished. On the sixth day of creation, God makes Adam, which means humanity, male and female, and then he appears to just leave them, you know, alone with this like evil talking snake, a really confusing tree, and ignorance of the fact that they are alone, and that's evil. Adam is alone in the presence of love, and I think we call that sin. It translates the Greek word hamartia, which is made up of the prefix ha or a, which means something like no or not, and martos, which means part or, or portion. So hamartia is like part of you that's missing. Romans 5.13, listen closely. Sin indeed was in the world before the law, that's the knowledge of good and evil, right? Isn't the law the knowledge of good and evil? Sin was, in a, or a commandment, don't eat from that tree. Sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Romans 7, 9. I was once alive, writes Paul, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. See, I think Paul is talking about himself. And he's talking about every little kid. That is all of Adam and every Adam. So you were once alive apart from the law until you learned to judge yourself and you realized that something was missing. <laughs> and you began to hide. Romans 14, 23. Whatever does not proceed from faith or faithfulness. There's one word that's translated both faith and faithfulness. Whatever does not proceed from, from faith is sin. So what was Adam missing on the sixth day of creation before the fall? Faith in love and the word of love. God is love, who is our helper, who is our husband. So original sin is original ignorance of love. And every baby is born ignorant of love. But you don't blame babies for that ignorance. Or at least I hope not. 
We don't blame babies, at least not until they come to know some good and evil, act out of their own faithlessness, and begin to hide in shame. You know, justifying themselves with themselves, creating an ego, a false self, a, a prison called pride, and an enlarged and fortified earthen vessel that is an alabaster flask, if, if you will. An alabaster flask in, in which each of us is trapped and alone but beginning to know it's not good to be alone. And it's like a, a part of me is missing. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, wrote Paul. I think it's the spirit that God breathed into the dust in the very beginning. And uh, the Spirit of Christ, who is the beginning, and also the Word, by which we are created, saved, and sanctified, finished in, in the image of God. In his book, Release of the Spirit, Watchman Nee wrote this, The alabaster box, or flask, must be broken. If the alabaster box is not broken, the pure spikenard will not flow forth. Strange to say, many are still treasuring the alabaster box, thinking its treasure exceeds that of the ointment, the perfumed oil. He's saying that our, our pride must be broken. He's saying that our soul must be opened in order for the spirit to flow uh, so our souls can breathe, so that we can commune with God and one another in one spirit. One breath, one river of life, one Lord, one faith, one, one baptism. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 7, listen closely to what Paul wrote. This, this should blow your mind. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. That's why it hurts so much when you join yourself to someone, prostitute or whomever, and then break that union and join yourself to another. It's ripping a body apart. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We are the body and bride of Christ according to Paul. So maybe this is exactly what Jesus, our helper, actually wants. A bride with no shame. A bride who loves him passionately, intimately, uninhibited, and, and free. So practical application point. Do that. Amen. But I know you're, you're thinking, well, do, do what exactly? Okay, I'll read it. Luke 7, 44. Look, she wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair, covered them in kisses, and anointed them with, with her fragrance. Do that. How do we do that? Next verse. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many. So Jesus isn't saying she's some kind of noble prostitute or something, Right? I mean, he, he's, he's not saying she did not sin. Jesus is not excusing her. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Aphaeontai, perfect passive indicative of aphiomi, to forgive or to let. So literally translated, therefore, for this reason, I'm telling you, Simon, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, have been allowed. For look, she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. C confused scholars can debate the meaning of all those verbs in the Greek and stuff, but it's very clear from the story that the one who knows that she's forgiven much loves much. And loving much is all that God who is love has ever required. So the one forgiven much loves much, and it's abundantly clear from the story that the one forgiven much has necessarily sinned much. And so this fall, John Perch, even though he doesn't know this yet, but John Perch will be teaching our midweek class and interactive discipleship program, the Sanctuary Sin Much Program. Step one, sin much testing in order that you can find your sin gift. 
Step two, interactive courses in fornication, murder, debauchery, larceny, disco dancing. Step three, forgiven much, you will love much. What do you think? Okay, there may be some problems. Number one, if you plan to sin, you cannot simultaneously plan to be forgiven of that sin. In other words, if you don't hate sin, you really don't know sin. And you can kind of tell this by whether or not you have compassion for sinners or not. But if you don't hate sin, you really don't know sin, and so you can't confess sin, and you cannot know that you've been forgiven of that sin. Sin is quite literally choosing hell. And I mean by that choosing to be alone. It's imprisoning yourself in darkness and desecration, which you will experience as pain and suffering and death. In the 14th century, Julian of Norwich claims that she heard the Lord say this, sin is necessary. But all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And then she writes this, But sin itself I did not see. Because I believe that sin does not have its own substance, or any form of being, nor can it be known except through the pain that it causes. You know, emptiness, which John spoke about last week, emptiness really is nothing. But when it's found in something, like an earthen vessel, or a womb, you can ask my wife about this, oh, it can cause an immense amount of pain. Apart from me, you can do nothing, said Jesus. And we know that sin is something that Jesus does not do. And so sin must be nothing. Even if it's destined to be filled with something. Maybe it's that part that Adam is missing. Okay, second problem with the Sin Much program. It may be that none of the sins in our Sin Much program are actually the much sin that Jesus is referring to. I mean, who sins much in this story. I mean, is Jesus really telling Simon that, you know, Simon, you need to get out there and sin some more? If anyone sinned much, the text indicates that Simon has already sinned much. He didn't provide water for Jesus' feet. He didn't kiss Jesus. He didn't anoint Jesus. In fact, he's using Jesus, trying to control Jesus and judge Jesus and who's Jesus. He's love in flesh. He's the good He's the life. So what is Simon's sin? Simon's using the knowledge of love to not love. Simon's trying to use love to create his own life rather than sacrificing his own life to the one who is love. Simon's trying to judge love, use love, control love for his own ends, and and God is love, and Jesus is love in the flesh. Simon's treating Jesus like a what? A harlot. Maybe that's why Jesus was so sympathetic to harlots, and why harlots seem to have no trouble understanding the gospel. (laughs) Jesus. They both knew the pain of $300 left on a pillow. They both knew the pain inflicted by folks who think that they can pay for love or who have already paid for love and are now disappointed. She knew. But Simon did not yet know that he had sinned much. He probably would not know until he actually saw that he had taken the life of love on a tree in a garden on the holy mountain. And that sin is a sin in which we have all participated. It's just that pastors and Pharisees 
are more skilled at hiding that fact from themselves. We have each and all taken the life and crucified the Lord of love. In the middle of our story, Jesus tells Simon a story, saying a certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. That's probably about 200,000 bucks, because a denarii was a day's wage. And the other 50, probably about 40,000 bucks. Now, if God is a moneylender, how much would you owe? Yeah, everything, right? For what do you have that wasn't first given to you by God? And if God is a money lender, how much could you pay that wasn't already first given to you as, as a gift? Well, nothing, right? In Matthew 18, Jesus tells of a debtor forgiven a fortune by a king, a debtor who won't forgive a pittance that he thinks is owed to himself by a friend. When the king finds out, remember, he throws this guy in prison until he pays all that is owed, which means that this man will remain in prison forever. Or until he believes that he has faith that all that is owed has always been forgiven by the king, which is the king's judgment from the very beginning. So if you think that you owe God anything that hasn't already been forgiven you, oh, you have trapped yourself in the deepest, darkest prison. Simon's been forgiven, and yet he's not forgiven. For he has trapped himself in his own prison until he finally hears the judgment of of the king. And that probably could only happen if the king were to descend into his prison. The moment you think that you can pay, you implicate yourself as a thief. For with what could you pay other than the life that has already been given? Some of you are trying to pay. No, all of us are trying to to pay, and it's only sinking us deeper into debt, for if we owe anything to God, it's gratitude for grace, a sacrifice of praise, uh, a a fragrant offering. Well, God's not a money lender. Got to be clear on that. God is the creator of all things. But Jesus says to Simon, one owed 500, one owed 50. When the moneylender saw that they could not pay, he canceled the debt. Karizomai, sometimes translated forgive. Ephiam is also translated forgive. Karizomai is translated forgive. From charis, which means grace. They, they, they could not pay, and he graced them. You means good. You charised, good grace, Eucharist. You cannot pay. And at the cross, you see that God has always graced you. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Did God ever have any illusions that you could pay any debt to him at all? No. Of course not. But you did. And we do, and that's why we're all miserable like Simon. We each owe until we know that we cannot pay but have been forgiven, and even this knowledge is a gift of grace, and I think we call it faith. It's a little crazy to think about, but it's like we've been all given absolutely everything except the knowledge that we have all been given like absolutely everything That is the knowledge that God is grace. Grace is relentless love. In the garden, Adam and Eve are given everything except one thing, the knowledge of good and evil. And and, and what is the good? Well, God is the good. God is relentless love, which is a communion of life. God is grace, and to be known by grace is to give birth to to faith. So we don't actually have a sin much program, but I think God has a love much program. Step one, create Adam mankind with grace. 
Step two, allow Adam to take grace and obtain the knowledge of not grace, that is evil. Step three, where Adam took grace, reveal that you have always given grace, which is the good, that is yourself. Step four, by grace create faith in grace in Adam, finished in the image and likeness of love. Grace is a relentless love. And God is love, and we are being made in His image. So we really don't need a sin much program. And uh, God already has, John's disappointed. He was excited about teaching that course, but we don't need a sin much program. God has, already has a love much program. If anything, we need a confess much program. Actually, I hope that's why you come to worship each week. And it should be the substance of any community life program during the week. In some form, we must always confess, step one, I've sinned. And step two, hear a brother or a sister tell us, in the name of Christ, the judge, you have been forgiven. That's a program. But you don't need to wait for a program. It should be every breath, expiring and inspiring. That's what life is. I don't know if you knew this, but there's an election in November. And I think that's why this text kind of captured my attention. Because you see, I really believe this. Satan w will do this. He will do all he can to do this. That is, use the election to get you to focus on the sins of other people. That's the way of the principalities and powers of this age. But it's not the way of the kingdom of God. So I'm not telling you for whom to vote. But I am telling you how to vote. Always vote with much love. So only vote after you have confessed much sin. Not other people's sins. Your sin. For myself, it means I need to pray something like this. Father, I, I don't love the unborn. Or even the newborns. Very much. And I don't love single mothers very much. Frightened women and sex workers who would weep, if, they'd weep at your feet if they could only see your face and hear your voice. And I don't love folks living down by the border worried about their jobs and their cities and drug trap. I, I, don't, I just don't love them all that much. And Father, I sure don't love poor Mexicans desperate for work all that much. Because if I did, I'd find a way to give to them before they ever were tempted to take from me. Jesus, King of the Jews. I don't love the Jews. Or the Palestinians, and you're the king of the Palestinians too. I don't love the Jews or the Palestinians all, all that much. I don't love my enemies. And Jesus, if you're the definition of love, I don't even think I, I love my friends. Father, I don't love love very much, if at all. You ever prayed something like that? You know, even in praying that, I, I don't love love, something inside of you does love, love, and just did love, love. I think it's faith. 
in grace. Relentless love. Confess, Father, I, you should pray this. I need to pray this a lot. I hope you pray this a lot. Father, it's like I'm trying to just constantly exalt myself. Pray that and something in you just humbled yourself. Confess, Father, I'm like constantly trying to justify myself, and something in you has already been justified. Confess, God, I can't save myself, and your faith just saved you. Confess, God, I can't do anything, and then you will know, well, it was your faith then that just made that confession. Luke 7, 47. Therefore, I tell you, Simon, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Look, she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Now, he's, he's already said that her sins were forgiven, and, and it seems that she's already confessed her sins, but it's like Jesus seems to really enjoy repeating the fact, your sins have been forgiven, and she seems to really enjoy expressing the fact that I'm a sinner that's been forgiven by, by him. I mean, she's not like groveling in her shame, it's more like she's swimming in God's grace and exuding God's grace, giving birth to God's grace right now, right here, even now in us. I think God forgets our sins, like Scripture says, because ultimately they're nothing. But he remembers everything that we've done, for all the nothing is now filled with his something, and so our sins go by a, a new name, and that name is faith. Just as the emptiness in my wife's womb goes by a new name, and that name is Jonathan, and Elizabeth, and Rebecca, and Coleman. I'm trying to say that Simon is hiding his shame, and he is miserable. But this woman is surrendering her shame. And she is absolutely overwhelmed, swept away with joy. It turns out that what Simon fears is the very worst of hells, is the very thing that this woman now discovers to be the very substance of heaven. Communion. Verse 48, and Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. 49, then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? See, the Jews understood that every sin is actually against the Creator and His Word. Against you and you only have I sinned, uh, wrote David in the Psalms. Verse 50, and Jesus said to the woman, your faith, literally the faith, you know, there's one Lord, one faith, writes Paul. So the faith, the faith of you, literally the faith of you has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has uh, saved you. You know, when Jonathan, our firstborn, was born, she said, look at my beautiful baby, but she was painfully, wonderfully aware that she did not make that baby. That baby was given to her as a gift, given to her and given through her. Apart from me, you can do nothing, says your helper. So if you think you can have faith apart from him, it's not faith. It's sin. And it isn't free will. It's a will imprisoned in an earthen vessel that's been constructed with lies straight from the father of lies. Listen to what Paul writes. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So who's talking? It's not Paul. He's dead. He just said so. How could it be Jesus? Or how could it be the Christ? Because there's talking about the Christ. You see, maybe there is no Christ or Paul. There is only Christ and Paul. Christ and Paul and Paul in Christ. That is two that are one. And we call this faith. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Saved by grace, we give birth 
to faith, and faith grows into a kingdom. Now, I don't know if any of you or some of you watching online, if any of you may have had this thought at a certain point, hey, preacher boy, are you suggesting that Jesus and this prostitute engaged in some form of hanky-panky in front of all those people in the house of a Pharisee? No. I'm preaching that Jesus and his bride experienced a moment of communion in the covenant of grace and begat faith in the house of a Pharisee. I'm saying that on the night that Jesus was betrayed by all of us unfaithful people, he took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant. It's a marriage covenant. This is the covenant in, in my blood. Uh, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is how he turns the great harlot into the bride. This is how God creates Adam in his own image, the image of love. He forgives much. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, he forgives much, and so we sin much. We're allowed to sin much. And then we see that we have always been forgiven much, and then we all love much, we love much for all time and for all eternity, and love is outrageously happy. So we invite you to take a piece of bread and dip it in, in the cup. This is what's missing. Adam. It's the fullness of faith faithfulness. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. You know, Anthony, I think that confusion you were feeling between those two songs is the edge of the sixth day and the seventh day. Mm. There's this really cool thing in the Revelation. I think it's at the end of the, I should know because they wrote a book on the Revelation, but at the end of the, I think when the sixth seal is opened in heaven, there's silence. And that's weird because he's already said, he's already seen the seventh day and every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them is constantly singing. So that makes sense to me because like when I confess my sins, I'm confessing all my illusions. I'm breaking that, that vessel, right? When I become silent, I can hear the song that's always being sung, which is the seventh day, which is the tune that um, we are to dance to. And uh, then when I hear that, the, the heart unfolds like a flower before him. And anyone in Christ is a new creation. All things have become new. The old has passed away. Um, all, all is made new, writes Paul. In other words, all creation begins to, to bloom. So by way of benediction, the wages of sin is death. So may you never ever sin again. But you already have sinned plenty. And so you ought to know that there's a gift in your sin. His name is the resurrection and the life. And you will find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in your manger, Mary. And of course, I'm talking to Mary of Magdalene and the Virgin Mary. Because I think they're all one Mary. And he is the faithful one. God consigned all to disobedience. They may have mercy on all. That he may create faith in all. In order that all would enjoy his banquet. He's good. Believe the gospel. Amen.